and those who are members, you're welcome home. Um, we try, we try at least um, to do something as a, a community outreach um, in the field of, of educating ourselves. That we've had several speakers here, um, and Father Sturgis is here, and I'm not doing the introduction, but I really um, welcome you because. We thought it would be a good time. Most people have Lenten retreats and they don't think about pre-Lenten stuff. So we thought maybe this would be a good way that we work ourselves into the season of great Lent, the great joy that, God, that the church has given us to return and to make our reflections back and returning back to God um, for our lives and our gifts that we've had and, and maybe the slothfulness that we've lived in the past year. Um, but before that happened, I wanted to make an announcement because I'm very excited about this. Um, we are currently um, in the process of planning for a major symposium um, that we're hosting with St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary um, on behalf of the National Church um, in particular. Um, this, this year, um, in September, will be the 225th anniversary that the missionaries came. I get emotional when I think about this. From Valam Monastery to missionize the North American continent. And it's a very historic event for the life of our church, and especially for the life of the Orthodox Church in America, because <clears throat> That is our seed and our foundation and our legacy. So 225 years ago, these monks left and they had an arduous journey that they had to travel through the, the Russian lands and find, find their way into what is our Alaska present day. And they embraced the people. They gave them a language and they taught them. We have a legacy as Orthodox Christians in America that is unlike any other Christian in America. We came here to bring the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We didn't come to colonize people. We didn't come to enslave people. We didn't come to make people into a culture that they were not. Our missionaries 225 years ago came to this great land with one purpose, and that's to bring the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, the gospel that was translated by St. Inokente into Aleut, given the Aleut language, is not a possession of us, but a possession of the American Bible Society in New York City. So his original translation of the gospel that he gave is, is, is a historic document in the American lands. Um, so we have a legacy, and we have a, a story to tell. So um, I took the opportunity to ask Metropolitan Tikhon because it's our first primate who has come out with a real strategy in his four pillars from this faith we hold. And I asked him if he would be able to present that, and it came into this big symposium. So he will be here. Um, Bishop um, David of Sitka will be here. Um, and um, the General Secretary of the National Council of Churches will be our presenters on our Saturday for the symposium. We will begin with the Akathis to the North American Saints. They will present, um, we will have lunch, and we'll have uh, vespers. The next day we will have um, Divine Liturgy, where the con celebrants will be Metropolitan um, Tikhon, Archbishop Michael, and Bishop David, um, and others. And we will have a banquet, and Father, uh, Dr. John Meindorf will be our guest speaker at the banquet at the Nassau Inn. So the theme really is the legacy of these missions. So we're, we're looking how the legacy is continuing through the Alaskan church in North America, how the four pillars of our primate really fits in with this legacy to lead us now into the next 225 years. Um, the national, the president, the Sec general secretary of the National Council of Church will be speaking about how significant the Orthodox Church in America has been in the American Christian witness and how we have contributed not only in ecumenical dialogue, but in also many areas in the American life. And Father uh, Dr. Paul Meindorf will finish that with continuing the legacy through our theological education. Because one of the things that the missionaries knew very quickly and was followed up by St. <coughs> Tikhon, a patriarch of Moscow and apostle to America, 
was that we needed to train indigenous clergy. We couldn't take clergy from foreign lands and bring them here. So St. Vladimir Seminary is a legacy of that, St. Tikhon Seminary is a legacy of that, and St. Herman's a legacy of that, that we train indigenous clergy for the American land to missionize the American people. Um, so I'm very excited about that, and that's going to be the weekend of May 11th and 12th, I'm just giving you a public announcement. And I turn it over to the best servant, leader of this parish, Deacon John. <laughs> Well, you can please forgive me, but I have to tell the story of how we came to know Father Sarah. Uh, early in 2014, too, went on the internet and found a pilgrimage to the Isle of Iona, which is a place that we, both of us, got to know very early in our lives before we, before we met, fell in love with it. So in the summer of 2014, we signed up to go on a pilgrimage. Um, with a group of about 30 other people. We went and stayed on the Isle of Mull, perhaps a mile from the ferry. It takes people three quarters of a mile over the, over the uh, bay, sea, whatever it is, to the Isle of Iona. And typically we would all go down and catch the ferry in the morning and come back in the evening. The first day we were there, we went to the, the wharf, waiting for the ferry to come over from Iowa to pick us all up. And the pilgrims and, and other passengers put their luggage on the side of the wharf, waiting for the ferry to come pick them up and go along, along with the luggage. And I looked down at one of the bags, the shoulder bag, embroidered with the logo of my most intense competitor, from Houston, Texas. <laughs> we would go at it tooth and nail, this company, great company, and here was a, show, a, a bag with a logo on it. Whose bag was it? A monk's. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kept it very close to me the rest of the week. <laughs> and came to know and love Father Seraphim, respect him greatly for his, the work that he's doing, which as you all know, I'm sure, is to establish a monastery on the Isle of Mall, the first Orthodox Celtic monastery for a thousand years on the Isle of, in, in the Scotland region. So here's some uh, particulars. Father Seraphim Aldea was tonsured and ordained a priest in 2005 at Ruska Monastery of St. Nicholas in Moldavia, Romania. He's the founder and priest monk of the Monastery of All Celtic Saints on the Isle of Mull in Scotland. He has a BA in Theology from the University of Bucharest, an MA in English Literature from Warwick University, PhD in Modern Theology from Durham University, where he studied with Andrew Lau, you were the Omega, if I remember correctly. Uh, Kluge Fellowship from the Library of Congress in the District of Columbia, Washington, and a three-year three postdoctoral fellowship from the Department of Theology of Oxford University. And we're very pleased to have Paul Sarah Willis to share about all things spiritual. <laughs> That's fine. At the end, there's no escape. You will have one <laughs> because it does give you some information about the monastery, and you get to see nice photographs that hopefully will encourage you to come onto one of our pilgrimages. <laughs> and also, it, it teaches you step by step how you can make a check towards the monastery. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, in many ways, what 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 Deacon John has said. It's pretty much what I'm trying to um, fight off, like, like pieces of clothes you want to get rid of. 
because I'll turn 40 by the grace of God at the end of this year. And uh, this has been my first year in my entire life when I was not involved or trapped in one way or another in, in a university. And, um, and that does create the risk of ending up being somebody who, who, who thinks and talks and interacts to people in a certain way, the way researchers do or the way academics do. And that, that is by far the worst thing that could happen to me as a human being. There are others for whom that is the path in their lives. There are others who do a brilliant job of being precisely that. But I'm not that, and um, I do not want to become that. Just as I do not want to become a marketer, that was really a, a problem and a temptation. By the end of the second year of working for the monastery, after um, I'd struggled through a number of parishes, presenting the monastery, giving various talks, um, there, there comes a moment when you feel there's a routine there, and you're just in front of people, and you already know what you're going to say, and although you can play the game well, and it looks like you're actually there, in your mind you can just go about whistling, or God knows what you're doing, because words just come by themselves. And I ended up struggling with that horribly, and, and, and making that a, you know, an item of my own confession, because it felt like I was cheating everybody I was meeting, and I was not giving them something that was true to me, something that was real in, in, in my own heart. So that's when my spiritual father told me that I have to change my attitude, and um, instead of preparing by thinking ahead about what I'm going to share with people, um, I should be preparing by praying and, and asking God for some word, and asking God that I feel if I manage to squeeze one ounce of love for you, it's unavoidable that you will sense that. And if you sense that, you are going to respond the same way. And then even if I stay here, I stay here saying the most silly things, which probably I shall be doing, it's irrelevant. Because we have met. And once you meet a human being, that's, that's almost more important than anything else. Because in communion, we, we, we find find Christ and we find our salvation in a very real way. <coughs> so that is just a bit of an introduction by means of which I simply want to say that I have no idea what I'm going to tell you today. <laughs> so if somebody, just one person in this room, could spare a second as I struggle uh, to say a prayer that God gives me something, if you have a question, if you have something that really is on your heart, not so much on your mind, but on your heart, please ask God that he gives me that question. Because honestly, all I know is that I have to tell you something about land. And I think something about light as well. I'll squeeze some light in there at some point. <laughs> all I remember from my pilgrimage with Dick and John and Judith and a, a lot of other people, my personal memories of the two of them, and particularly Dick and John, was um, our trip to St. Columba's Bay on the island of Iona, which is at the very end, the other end from where the ferry leaves you. Um, and we had to take this rather long and strenuous hike through the desert area of Iona. It's called a desert because to this day nobody lives there. There are no homes, uh, and most people avoid that area because there's no, no marked path towards the bay where St. Columba landed. Um, and yet we ventured that way, and we found it. And I took, it, I must have taken hundreds of photographs, because I knew the next time I would be there, I would be leading a pilgrimage myself. And of course, the last thing you want as a leader of a pilgrimage is to get lost looking for the site. <laughs> Guess what happened in my first pilgrimage to St. Columba Bay? We got so lost that to this day I cannot believe, I, 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 I do not understand how it could take us three hours of being lost on an island. You can get from one side of it to the other in about an hour. We must have gone in circle. We didn't find anything. I was just praying for a bay. Any bay, any bay. So I can tell them this is the bay. Now let's get home, people. And we didn't find anything. 
But you find anything, all those photographs you are useless because everywhere you turn it looks the same, which is something I hadn't considered at the time. There are no markings of any way. When we went actually there was a path. If you go later in the year, what happens is that all that green pasture is dried by the sun and there's nothing left. There's just nothing left. There's no way you can find your way. And that's what I remember mostly. I then had to go and camp on Iona, on my own. I took my tent and I camped there for, I think, 10, 10 days. And I just went every single day to that bay so that that never happens again. And now you're safe. If you come, you're safe. <laughs> <laughs> I can take you there with my eyes closed. So it's fine. Father, Father Peter mentioned as he was beginning his, uh, just before he began his uh, introduction, that I do not wear a proper kamilavka. <laughs> and um, I usually ask God that he gives me some sort of intro into what I have to say just before I open my mouth. So I have to trust that that is actually the intro he gave me. Okay. And, and I did tell Father that it's true, it's not a Russian kamilavka, it's not a Greek one, it's not even a Romanian one. It is um, an island's hat, because the reality of my life is that I live on the Isle of Mull. And everybody there wears a hat, because it's so windy all the time. And even more to the point, this is not just any hat. This is a hat made of wool of our indigenous sheep. If there is a motto for the Isle of Mull, it could be something like, um, where black sheep find a home. <laughs> because our sheep, the indigenous sheep, are naturally black. You do not have to dye their wool. That's their color. Actually, the, 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 the younger they are, the lambs, have very dark colored wool, and the older they get, it gets slightly reddish, brownish. My suspicion is that I, I'm wearing um, a slightly middle-aged lady's wool <laughs> because it's slightly brown. There is a risk in all of us as, as persons, and there is also a risk in us as a church, to lose sight of the reality of life that goes on around us, and to lose sight of the real human beings that we are surrounded by, and to create all these um, fantastic imaginary beings or realities and then try to live our lives in these imagined realities. And I see that in many ways. For instance, when people come to America, they imagine things. They expect things to be a certain way and they expect people to be a certain way. And of course, when you come here, you realize reality is a different story. Uh, when people think about Scotland, and I know this from the questions I get wherever I go, they imagine this um, fairy land where there are fairies still, and everybody weaves their tartan, and they drink whiskey all the time. And um, I'm afraid that apart from the whiskey part, none of that is real. <laughs> and there is great danger in, in living this sort of life. There is great spiritual danger in losing sight of the reality of the world around us, and the reality of our own beings, and trying to kind of crawl our way through life, and spiritual life in particular, with these imaginary beings in our minds. An, an, an example that, that I've, been, I've been, you know, hit with recently, actually, is that we, we all have this beautiful image of trying to help people who are poor. You'll go and you'll feed the homeless, and you'll go and you'll visit people in prison, or people who are ill in hospitals, and you know, when, when you give yourself to that person, then the homeless person will smile and tears will come out of your ears and the light will come out of the sky and all of a sudden Christ is there just beside you and you think that that's going to happen and you hope that that's going to happen, but that only happens in our minds. Because the reality is that when you take that sandwich or those whatever, five dollars or whatever you have, to sacrifice for, for, for that human being in front of you, that person can be a horrible person. That Not all homeless people are angels in disguise. They can be mean. Life made them mean. They can smell horribly. They can even start to kick you or say nasty things to you. 
or you go into a prison and everybody you see in your mind, in our minds, we whitewash people into innocent beings. But those people you, you are there to meet and help and, and exchange some human interaction with could be real murderers. They could indeed be bad people who are there for a very good reason. Uh, not that I personally in any way see any reason in keeping people in prison, but that's another conversation. What I'm trying to say is that it's very, very common for all of us to imagine a perfect world where Christ's commandments are almost natural to be put into practice. And then once you try to do your little bit, you are hit by the reality. And most of us shy away from that reality and we run away from it and we are disappointed of it. Almost as if, oh, this homeless person is not really the angel in disguise he or she should be. So therefore, you feel like you've not achieved anything and you, you tend not to do it again or you tend to judge that person in front of you. So instead of ending up doing something good, you end up doing something bad. Instead of helping the person, you, you actually take a stick, metaphorically, and kick them, kick them some more by judging and condemning them. It is vital that we realize that these people around us are the real people Christ has commanded us to love not some nice imaginary beings that never exist. And that is reflected not only on a personal level, on a one-to-one -one level, but particularly, and I, I think it's mostly painful, when you see it reflected um, en masse within communities. I have met so many people in, in, in my travels, and there tends to be, and especially in America, there tends to be this temptation to see us, Christians, and Orthodox in particular, as somehow not related to the world almost. That's saying that we are, um, you know, uh, in the world, but not of the world, is taken almost always to mean that we have nothing to do with the world around us. And there are plenty of justification for that, justifications for that, because the world around us indeed is not Christian in any outward way, and it's not going in a Christian direction that is plainly obvious to anyone who has eyes. Everyone is sinful. Everything in, in society and in, in the world is clearly going in an anti-Christian direction. And yet, for some reason, Christ put us here, and I doubt that anything in, in God's will happens by accident. I doubt that we, we, we were born here, in this place and in this time, just by accident, some sort of um, bad joke that Christ is playing on us. This bad-looking, sinful, fallen, non-Christian, maybe even anti-Christian world this is the world that we are called to save. This is the real world that we are called to save. Not an imaginary world that existed somewhere else in another time. In the Byzantium Empire in the first millennium. Or in Holy Russia in the you know, 17th, 18th century. Or God knows where today, if anywhere today. No, we, we do not exist in a different time, and we do not exist in a different place. We are alive here and now. And Christ is not going to ask you or you or myself about the people who lived 30 or 300 years ago in China or in, in Russia. He is going to ask me, what have I done in relation to these people? who are real flesh and bones, skins and brains. Sinful, but real people. And very soon, it's, it's this Sunday that we are going to hear that gospel when, when Christ asks us and tells us, you have helped me, you have fed me, you have visited me or not. And you see how interesting it is that it almost, we take it for granted that people who who have not helped Christ would be surprised. But for me, what is interesting is that the people who have helped Christ 
they seem surprised as well. When have I hurt you? I've never seen you in my life. When have I hurt, you know, fed you or clothed you or anything? It's the first time I see you face to face. And Christ is very clear that by doing these things to the little, real, sinful, fallen human beings around us, we have done it to Him. And that is something we have to remember. Christ's commandments are perfect and they reflect a perfect reality. Christ's commandments tell us something about who He is as a perfect man and who He wants us to become in our perfect humanity. But what we are called to do is to apply these perfect commandments in a very imperfect, very fallen and sinful world, of which, if we are to be completely honest, we are very much part of, and uh, probably just as equally sinful as the world we, we condemn. Even more, if I may share that with you, we are partakers and co-bearers of the fault for the sin of this whole world. Because there's no separation between us, and if somebody is standing and not falling, that is not exclusively his or her merit, but is the merit of, of the community of large. Somewhere in this church, somewhere in this world, there is somebody praying. And for the prayers of those people, he or she has managed to stand and not fall into sin. And similarly, when people fall, when people are born with horrible temptations, horrible passions that they can barely fight, if they can fight, we partake of that fault. We... I think one, one of the greatest temptations of our time is to rationalize things and to pretty much make an intellectual item of things that should in fact be contemplated in faith and accepted in faith. And because we lack that faith, we receive these commandments, we receive these realities, and then we squeeze them into our little brains. And because we are proud enough to think that through our brains we can understand everything, including God himself, we think that that is reality itself. We forget that the world is so much more complex than we shall ever be able to comprehend. We forget that we are material beings living in a world that is filled with spiritual beings. We not only forget, but when we remember it as Christians today, it's almost as if we feel ashamed to state it. There's a sense of embarrassment to speak in, you know, 21st century America, uh, being 21st century Christians, about angels or demons and a spiritual world around us. But that's not something that the saints were ever ashamed to witness to. And it's definitely not something Christ himself was ashamed to tell us about and teach us about. I have increasingly, through confession, hearing confession, and through meeting people and praying, I have grown to understand, not here, but here, more and more, that we are all one human being. And that indeed, if there is any definition of the church, it can only be this, this one big human being that includes everybody who was ever created in his or her personhood. And this may seem completely unrelated to anything practical and lacking any sort of um, practical value, but it isn't really, and it is reflected in many, many ways. I have heard people in confession saying, I cannot change this thing. Uh, it is greater than I am. It is stronger than I am. I have even heard things that this is how I was born. And of course, as a Christian, as a Christian monk and priest, I struggle. Because how can I believe that Christ has created this 
imperfect human being. How can I believe, how can I accept that Christ has created these people imperfect in a spiritual way, which is different from creating someone without a leg, or with some sort of, I don't know, you know, mental problem, because not having your full body or not having your full brain functioning is a different problem from being born with what you perceive as a spiritual problem. Because then, you know, I don't have a, ne a leg, but Christ does not condemn me for it. I am suffering from God knows what syndrome or some sort of, uh, you know, mental illness, but God does not condemn me for it. But there are so many passions, especially today, that we see that affect people according to what they say and increasingly I struggle not to believe them because my heart tells me to believe them. There are so many people who fight with spiritual illnesses, spiritual passions, and that's entirely different because all of a sudden you feel condemned from the moment you are born. You feel condemned from the moment you become aware of who and how you are. And then I found this teaching in the Fathers, that we are all one, that when we are created in the image of God, the first pages of the scripture of the Old Testament, the very first pages, let's create man in our image, not mine, our. There's a multiplicity implied there. Yes, we are, each of us created in the image of Christ, and that reflects our personhood, that reflects that each and every one of us is a human, potentially a human person. But we are also created in our image, says God. So the image of the Holy Trinity. And that is no longer about me as a person, that is about us as a church and us as a community. The same way that the Holy Trinity exists as one and a freeness at the same time, in the same way the church, that mystical church, exists as a multiplicity of all these billions of human beings that were ever created and the oneness that makes us all one. And what does that imply on a practical level? That if I stand or that if I fall, my success or my sin will affect every one of you. And that if I fall or if I sin, it is my fault and it is my success. But on some level, that is reflected on you because you have failed to help me not fall, or you have helped me stand. You see, if you go back to that embarrassing vision of a spiritual world, a world that doesn't really fit our theoretical, logical mindsets, we are surrounded by all these beings, and the Church has taught us all these things, but nobody pays any attention to them anymore. I've uh, been now in a parish in Indiana, and I was part of the baptism of a beautiful, beautiful little girl. And by the grace of God, just by the grace of God, she's called Serafima, so I felt very, very much connected with that little girl. I love her and her family so much. But it was so striking to me, speaking to everyone around and the parish at large, how little attention they were paying to the process of actually what's going on until we baptize these children. We, it's, all, it's very interesting how we, we are so vocal um, in fighting against abortion because we recognize that these are real human beings. That we are dealing with. This is not some sort of, you know, piece of flesh that will then at some point miraculously become a human being. If, if, if God forbid tomorrow I'm, I'm in some sort of horrible accident and I lose both my arms and both my legs, that piece of 
meat of flesh that's left is still me entirely. It, our humanity is not dependent on how heavy we are or how much our bodies are developed or not developed. We are human beings from the moment of our conception. We know that. We fight to protect that. And yet there's no awareness that spiritually these little human beings exist and fight a spiritual world from the moment they are conceived. We forget, forget as, as parents or neighbors or friends or larger families of, of these wonderful pregnant ladies that whatever happens to them and around them while they are pregnant or whatever happens to these babies between the time they are born to the time when they are baptized, that spiritual world influences them. Of course, we are adults now. We are responsible for our responses to temptation. We also have the great weapon of the grace of baptism. But these tiny little beings don't. They are entirely exposed to whatever spiritual beings we bring about. There's a reason why after birth, the church recommended that mothers should, should stay at home and not be visited for 40 days until baptism. Like, stay in your nest and protect your baby. Because you don't know what spirits everybody who comes to visit you brings about. There's a reason why the church asks the father and the mother of, of the new baby to come and commune as often as possible, to have a good life through the pregnancy, to make their confessions, to always be prepared. Because if you as a father do not keep in check the spirits that fight you, you are bringing home that spiritual world. Do not imagine that whatever fights you, whatever passion fights you, will just be kind and polite enough to stay at the door when you go inside your home. It will travel with you, and it will travel with your friends and with your neighbors and everyone who comes in contact with that little baby. That's why the church blesses the home. That's why the church has those exorcism prayers before baptism, because that child, only a few days old, already has passions, seeds of passions in their hearts, in their souls, as those prayers tell us. And they, those seeds, are not their fault. They are ours. And they will end up living a long life as adults, fighting things that they do not understand where do they come from. Why do I feel this? Why do I fight this? I did not ask for this fight. I did not ask for this battle, which is so much stronger than I am. And every time I hear that, I feel like just shrinking because I'm aware of my own sins. And I'm aware that instead of being a light to this world and fighting through my prayer for those who are now being conceived, I also contribute to the seeds of, of sin that get implanted into these new babies. I don't know how we got here, but this is where God took me. And, um, and it's in a way connected to everything we are being taught by the church. It's the wonderful and most practical uh, piece of advice by, again, my beloved Saint Seraphim of Sorrow, that the way to find your salvation and the way to do missionary work, if you want into the world today, is not necessarily to go out into the streets and scream, repent, or Christ is here, or Christ is coming. We should, each of us, focus inside so that each of us acquires the Holy Spirit. And once we have done that, once we have the Holy Spirit alive and dwelling in us, then thousands around us will be saved. That teaching makes no sense on a logical level. 
it can be reduced to just being selfish and uncaring. And how can my salvation be reflected automatically almost on thousands around me? Well, it can, if you keep in mind what we've just talked about. If you become a chalice for the Holy Spirit, if you go into the world as a saint, a living saint, just emanating light, which is not visible to us, but is visible again in the spiritual world, as you travel these streets, as you go into your offices, as you go into your, I don't know, neighbor's homes, that light will clean everything around because the souls of these people, it doesn't matter what color they have, if they are white or black or purple or pink or whatever color they have, it doesn't matter if they are virtuous or sinful, it doesn't matter if they love women or men or goats or rabbits, it's completely, completely irrelevant because their soul will recognize the presence of the God who made them. And every time I and you walk the streets and go into your offices without the Holy Spirit in us, we have failed. We have failed not only ourselves, but all these thousands whom God put before us. Because make no mistake, we never meet anybody by accident. There is no accident in Christ's world. And we will be asked, not what have you eaten during your Lenten period, but we will be asked, well, I sent that person before you 127 times in your lifetime. Have you given them anything? And I dread to say that my answer probably will be mostly no. And it will be, why? And I'm going to say, well, I had no money, or I had no food, or I had no time, or I had... And I know, I know what Christ will tell me. I have told you to become a saint. I have told you to acquire the Holy Spirit. If you had only done that, even if you'd kept your big mouth shut, as I should as a monk, even if you had no money and no food and no time, just through your presence, that would have been the greatest thing you could have given that person. Because that person could have met me through you. And when you failed to be a saint, you have failed not only yourself, but all those thousands I chose and I sent your way. I'll tell you one more thing, just because it nags me. Um, when I said what I said about, you know, Christ is not going to ask you what you've eaten or not eaten during Lent, I don't want you to misunderstand that. I am frighteningly <laughs> traditional when it comes to Lent and when it comes to fasting and when it comes to a prayer and all the rules of the church I I don't relate to them on a logical kind of level because again it makes no sense they make no sense if you are to be honest if we are to be honest nothing of our faith makes sense and it's actually very good because if it made sense if it had been a logical system where everything can be proven logically, you know, you can infer one thing from the other, then it would, be, it, would, it would not be called faith. It would be called a logical system, which would be readily available to anyone who has the brains, the education, and the mental capacity to go through a system, the way you learn mathematics or physics or whatever each of us has studied. But faith is something else. Faith begins where logic is useless. That's why it's always compared to walking on water. We all know that if I'm going to walk here, I'm not going to sink. But to walk on water, that can only be done in faith. There are two temptations that I have identified traveling this wide, tiny world of ours. One 
is to, to wipe away God from the equation and to replace Christ with the traditions the church has given us. And that is deadly for the spiritual life of those people. This is a particularly Eastern temptation. It's, it, you'll find it uh, almost everywhere in the Orthodox countries, in Russia, Romania, Serbia, and so on. Not so much in Greece, they are a bit more free and happy. Uh, but in the other countries, fasting comes with its own rules, and you must follow those to the letter. The risk there always, and I have seen this, is that we forget that there's a purpose why we do these things. They are not ends in themselves. It doesn't really matter if you hold a fork correctly in your hand, if you forget to use it to put food into your mouth. That's pretty much what it is, to keep all the rules of fasting and of prayer and night vigils and all of that, and forget that at the end of all of these, the purpose of all of these is that you fulfill Christ's commandments, which are to love God and to love your neighbor. If you take anything and you put them instead of Christ, you will fail to see the living God. It's pretty much like in that other parable of God when uh, there's a rich man calling everybody to a, a wedding or a, a banquet and they say, oh, we can't come because either I got married or I bought some land or I bought some oxen or something and they all give an excuse. The striking thing about these excuses is that they're all good things. None of them says, oh, I can't come because I want uh, to go and have a party with my best friend or I can't come because last night I was in a club and I'm dead tired today or, you know, they are all very good reasons. Marriage and work, these are things that Christ, Christ, God gave us and blessed us to do. And yet when you take something good and blessed and you end up worshipping that instead of God, when you put those rules and commandments and regulations at the center of your life and you forget about Christ, then you don't end up okay. Because those people did not end up okay. You may end up passing by the living Christ and not notice him because all your focus is on the rules and regulations. On the other hand, there's the other temptation, which is particularly a Western thing, from my experience at least, which is if in the East they kind of take a nice sponge and they erase Christ, in the West, it's almost as if we take another sponge and we erase humanity. And we, we end up in this other imaginary world where we are already kind of pre-saved. Everything has already been done. There's pretty much no need for us to do anything. If you fast or if you don't fast, it's irrelevant almost. If you say your prayers or if you don't, again, it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, if we pray for somebody or if we don't, it's irrelevant because everything is in God's will, everything is in God's hands, everything is up to God, yes and no. Because this is not a mechanism. Salvation is not done automatically, it's not a machine. We have to put in our little penny. We have to contribute with our will. We do have to keep the fast. Because that fast is going to offer me so much more. First of all, it's obedience to the church. It teaches us obedience. Even if you are not a monastic in a monastery, because you fast, that shows your obedience to 2,000 years of tradition to this church. It also makes you more open to the experience of those who have no food in real life. So it, it helps you have more compassion and love for them. It also changes the way you think, and it opens you up more to love and faith. I can tell you that fasting, especially when you do it like full steam ahead, with the three days of you know no food, no water, no nothing at the beginning, and three days at the end, and following all the rules of fasting, no oil, and one meal a day, and all of that through land, by the end of land, and this is not a metaphor, you are a different human being. You are an entirely different human being. Because by that point, in these 40 days, 
you have fought and have defeated your brains, your instincts, your experience, um, even your need to fight for your own survival because you feel weak and there are all these reasonable uh, motives why you should let go of fasting at least for a tiny little while. There are all these experiences you've had. Oh, but if I don't eat, I'm going to collapse. I'm going to faint. I'm going to... Uh, and, and if I only let go fasting just for a little while, or if I don't do this, um, if I continue with, with fasting this way, I'm not going to be uh, good enough, kind enough, strong enough to go and feed those poor homeless people. And the minute you forget about fasting and you just let go of it just a little bit, you also forget about the homeless. It's unavoidable. By the end of Lent, Lent is like a laboratory. If you could think of Lent as 40 days in a lab, where everything that you know, all your logical thinking, all your experience that you've accumulated in your life, you put them aside, and for 40 days you play this game of let's live a life according to what the saints are teaching me. And let's see what can happen. Am I going to drop dead? If you do that through the 40 days, at the end of those 40 days, I tell you, and I'm a priest and a monk in a church before the holy altar, you, there's no way I can describe to you how different you will be. Because it's not a logical change, it is an experiential change. It's like, it's like you imagining what it would feel like to be a parent before actually giving birth to your children. It's like imagining what it's like to be in love before you actually go through the experience. I can describe things to you of the experience, but once you've gone through it, and only once you've gone through it, you'll know what, what, what I want to tell you about. I will end this thing, whatever this was, <laughs> by thanking whoever here said a little prayer, because there was a little prayer. And uh, this talk clearly took me places I had no intention to go, and, uh, and I need to thank you for that. I have decided about three years ago to completely allow you the people I meet, these people I meet, to shape whatever I have to offer you because I do not know you. I have never met you before and I do not know your needs. I do not know what, what would be helpful for you. Father does. I have absolutely no idea. So the only way for me to be of any real use to you is to open up and for you to say a little prayer. Keep in mind, and I do promise this is the last statement, this is not about knowledge. This is not about acquiring knowledge. You can get knowledge from books and the internet and universities and so on. A real spiritual life is not about knowing things. It's about living them and making yourself go through those experiences. The devil is the greatest theologian of all of them. He knows everything. There's no professor of theology on this earth who knows more in terms of theology than the devil because he has seen God and continues to live in a spiritual world. We don't. The devil knows everything but has failed to practice it. What I pray for me and what I pray for you is that God will send at some point in our lives one particular person with one particular line, one word, one message only that will strike me and will strike you as being the thing for me. And then may Christ help me and may Christ help you once you've identified the word to struggle your entire life 
to actually make that world into a living reality. Because if you do that, just struggling, it doesn't matter if you succeed or not. Just try again and again to put it into practice. If you do that, if I do that, then we are going to meet again up there, floating above, <laughs> or however we imagine heaven to be. Thank you so, so very much for keeping me. God bless you. I think the words prayer that you heard, and part of it is that we were debating in our parish about changing our vision statement. And our vision statement is going to be to create saints. And if we don't create saints as a church, then we miss our mission. So I think you talked very quickly to that. What I would like to do is give you a, a couple of minutes of a break and to digest what you just heard. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll have questions for the good topic. Okay. So there's coffee, water, um, plenty of snacks. If the restroom is here and the restroom is here, if we just take a, a just a 10 minute break and then we could come back and ask questions, okay? I know that some people um, were coming in as you came in. Welcome. Um, and get some water, get some.